Now, how many of you are familiar with Westboro Baptist Church? A few of you. Okay, so, right, yes. That I, I hope that we all, if you know them, that you feel a slight twinge of revulsion, not because they as pe- we don't want to have hatred for people just like, oh, they're gross. Well, thus are we all, but by the grace of God, right? But they do, by their tactics, misrepresent Christ, and that should give us a little bit of a bitter taste in our mouth, or a lot of a bitter taste in our mouth, rather. Um, Westboro Baptist Church became infamous for picketing at, like, the funerals of American soldiers, talking about how God hates, you know, they're infamous for their sign saying, God hates, and then a, a, a crass word for homosexuals. Um, that, that was kind of their thing that they were known for. So, a very, very brash, in-your-face presentation of, quote-unquote, the gospel. On the other side, so, okay, so we have, there's Proposition 1 from Westboro Baptist Church, God hates gays. On the other side, Proposition 2, you have, from the modern church in general, God loves everybody. These are the two competing worldviews in our day and age, summed up in a sentence. Well, I mean, obviously there's the truth, right? That's, but I'm talking about the two extremes here. So, both those statements are true, and both those statements are false, if, depending on how, we define and understand the terms. And it brings emphasis on the importance of allowing God to define the terms. Does God hate gay people? Well, what does the Bible say? John 3.36 says, and this is the passage, everybody goes to this passage to talk about how God loves the world. In John 3.16, well, John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So does God hate gays? Well, them and everybody else who is not in Christ. The wrath of God abides on sinners as a whole. Our job as Christians is not to pick out any one sin and say, God hates you people, you specific people, and he didn't really hate me. I was already pretty good, and that's why he saved me. That is not the gospel. The gospel is God hates all sinners because all sinners have broken his law. He's a holy God. It's not just he's up there arbitrary, arbitrarily hating people because he's just hateful. He's holy. He hates sin. Sin cannot come into his presence. His wrath abides on those who do not repent and believe in Christ. So, is God hates gays true? Well, kind of. But even saying it that way, you already are misrepresenting God. He doesn't just like... Specifically, I, just, I hate that particular class of sinners. They're just gross to me. I'm not going to save them. I'll save the rest, but not them. You guys are you're just outside of... No. We were, we were all... Thus were some of you. You were this, you were this, you were this sinner, that sinner, murderer, adulterer, fornicator, homosexual, the whole list. Disobedient to parents. It's on the same list. The wrath of God abides on all sin. So then, does God love everyone? Well, what does the Bible say? About that, God, first of all, God does manifest a general love to all sinners by making the sacrifice of Christ available to all. John 3, 16, God so loved the world. There is this general love for the whole world that God manifested in sending his son. The call of the gospel goes out to everyone. So in that sense, God's love is made available to everyone. Yes, God loves everyone in that sense. At the same time, we just talked about the wrath of God abides on those who aren't in Christ, okay? So there's a specific love that God loves those sinners who repent and believe in Jesus. That's how you become a child of God. People say, we're all children of God. Same kind of thing. Are, is everyone a child of God? Well, yes, we were all made by God. We were all made in the image of God. If that's what you mean, then yes, we are all children of God. But if by that you mean God loves us all, in an intimate father and child relationship? No, that is not what the Bible says. We are not all children of God. The way we become a child of God is to be born again through Christ. John chapter 14, verse 21. He who has, this is Jesus speaking, he who has my commandments and keeps them, 
He it is who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. God does not love everyone that way. He loves believers. He loves those who are in Christ in that way. Number four, God's electing love is sovereign. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. So the love that God has for his children is sovereign. He chooses who he is going to love. That's not something we earn. That's not something because I am not of that class of people. That's why God loves me. No. God loves me because he chose to love me. That's the pattern incidentally set for husbands in Ephesians. Did Jesus love his bride before or after she was beautiful? He loved her before she was beautiful. He chose her of his own free choice. And then he sanctified her and made her holy. And husbands are called to have the same kind of sacrificial love that says, I I choose to love you, whether you seem lovable or not, because Jesus chose to love me in the midst of my sin. So God's electing love is sovereign. He chooses us. He shapes us. He makes us beautiful. And that electing love is not given to everyone. And we can say, why not? Why then does he still find fault for who resists his will? And that's what Paul responded to. And he said, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? God has the right to display both his wrath towards sin and his mercy and grace. And he does both. And he is right to do so. Number five, and here's where we get into some sticky territory where I I readily admit I don't have all the answers here. But our gospel preaching should be informed by this truth. Now, how does that look? I'm not sure, but I find interesting the phraseology of Peter's proclamation of the gospel in Acts chapter 2, verse 39. Peter says, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. So he says, This promise and proclamation is available for all of you. All of you, come and believe. All of you who God has called to to himself. Well, which is it, Peter? It's both, right? From a horizontal perspective, I think it was, was it Spurgeon? Who said, if the elect all had a a yellow stripe down their back, instead of preaching the gospel, I'd go around lifting coattails, figure out who the elect were. But they don't. There's no way to know who's elect and who's not. So as preachers of the gospel, we're just supposed to preach to everybody because the call is for everyone, anyone who believes, will be saved, but only those whom God has called will believe. So how do do we make our gospel preaching reflect that truth? Let's talk about that one. I'm not entirely sure. You know, if you're not, I think you can err to the right or to the left on that to, you know, to where you you tell your children, okay, you can't sing Jesus loves me until you've been, you know, until you've been repented and baptized because we're not sure. I, I think there's There's much to hope from the biblical talking about the covenants and God's faithfulness to the future generations. That's just one issue. Or preaching the gospel. You give the gospel tract to somebody on the street and say, you know, maybe maybe you can be saved. Maybe not. You know, God only knows. But just in case, read this. That's that it's clearly not the biblical approach, right? But at the same time, this kind of gospel presentation that's God loves you, his heart is just breaking over you. He just so desires for you to come and be with him. That doesn't really present God as a sovereign God. God's not up there helpless, hoping that maybe somebody will believe in the gospel. He is much more in control than that. And our gospel preaching should reflect that. Number six, God's personal love is only ever available to sinners through Christ. Okay, that's worth saying again. Because when we understand that, that answers a lot of the questions here. God's personal love, this kind of intimate love that we're talking about, where he loves you, for you, for who you are, That is only ever available to sinners through Christ. Romans 8, 37 to 39. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
God loves us because of Christ. It's not just because we are we are that lovable. It's not just because we are we're sweet and cuddly and kind of flawed heroic characters in our own little, you know, BBC miniseries. We're sinners, but it is because of Christ's sacrifice that we can still be loved by a holy God and forgiven. And number 7, just like just from this passage we just read, if you are in Christ, if you have repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ, God's love is not only for you, as kind of like this abstract, well, yeah, God loves you. God's love is the active force in the relationship. He really loves you a lot, passionately, fervently. He loves you with the kind of love that will not leave you the same. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. If you have repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, you are safe. You are saved. Not because you saved yourself but because an almighty God loves you unto salvation. He is not going to let go. Praise God for that. That is a beautiful truth in which we may rest.